Good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world right now. I'm Jamie coming to you from Stonemeyer Games headquarters, i.e. my office, which for now is also where I live. Um, as you can see, I have an air mattress set up. You can see Walter right over there. Um, and the reason for this is I played games with um, a friend and then a friend of that friend on Saturday. And the, uh, the friend of the friend developed COVID symptoms on Sunday and tested positive on Monday. And so on Monday, I got the news that I had had a prolonged exposure to someone who definitely has COVID. I tested negative on Tuesday and I haven't tested since then. I'm going to test tomorrow on day five. I think that's one of the other crucial days, but I don't have any symptoms yet. Um, and so I'm, I'm feeling fine so far, but just a precarious thing. And I don't want to get Megan sick. And so I've been, uh, kind of stay into my own space here over the last couple of days. And most of that's been good. The weird side effect of it is that um, I definitely don't sleep as well in here. Uh, it gets pretty hot in here at night. I'm sleeping in here with Biddy and the litter boxes. And so Biddy is a very active night cat. And so I have not gotten very good sleep over the last two nights. So whereas so far, I feel like my vaccinations and my double boosters are, are hopefully preventing me from actually getting COVID. In the meantime, I'm getting terrible night's sleep, which is not good for me either. And last night, I was just completely out of it. Um, my, I had a really nauseous stomach ache, uh, tummy, tummy ache, stomach pains. Um, I had a headache and I ended up going to bed at 7.30. I usually go to bed, I usually fall asleep at 11 o'clock at night. Um, so I went to bed at 7.30 last night which you would think normally would be a sign that maybe I have COVID. And it is possible. I haven't tested myself since Tuesday. But um, I think it's a lot more relegated to the terrible night sleep I had the night before. And last night after that good long nap wasn't much better. So we'll see how I do today. Hopefully I'll make sense when I'm talking to you today. That is a long story short as to why I, my, I have a bed in my office right now because I am quarantining just in case I have COVID. Um, or, yeah. That's, what, that's what's going on with me. I, hopefully you are safe and COVID free. And let's talk about some things that aren't disease related. Let's talk about uh, games that went out. So the games I was playing on Saturday when I had this, uh, this prolonged contact with someone who turned out to have COVID were Dead Reckoning and Moonrakers, two games that I had really been wanting to play for quite some time, um, two great deck building games. And I, I really enjoyed both of them. Um, yeah, so, so Dead Reckoning is a pirate-themed game where you are crafting cards that you're using to cycle through a deck, kind of like deck building, but you don't actually increase any number of cards. Instead, you're leveling up the cards and adding new plastic cards to them to make them, to upgrade them, to make them even better. That was a lot of fun. That was my favorite mechanism of the game. But I also had a surprisingly um, a, a good time with the combat system in it. It's a really fun, rewarding combat system that doesn't make you feel bad if you attack somebody else. You're all going to get stuff as a result from, from fighting each other. I, I thought it was really, really clever, a fun cube tower um, mechanism that's worth checking out. If you're trying to design a cool combat system, check out the combat system in Dead Reckoning. And we also played Moonrakers. Moonrakers is really cool too. That's one that I've been wanting to play where it's also a very simple deck building game that's mission driven. And the missions for the most part are so difficult that you can't complete them by yourself. You need the help of other players. And oftentimes you go into a mission not completely knowing whether or not you will have the resources to complete the mission because during the mission itself, you might be drawing cards to hopefully draw into the resources you need to complete it. So that's really fun. A really nice touch of negotiation in a deck building uh, mission complete, completion game. Uh, Joshua says that Dead Reckoning is his favorite game of the year thus far. Reminds me a lot of Scythe, which inspired it. Yeah, it was, it was neat to see one of the, the core systems in Scythe finds its way into Dead Reckoning, which is the, um, the objective completion. So the way that you end a game in Scythe is that you complete now they're not called objectives inside, but you you place six different stars on the different goals available in the game. In Dead Reckoning, it's you have to place at least four equivalents of these stars. They're not stars in Dead Reckoning, but you have to place at least four of them. But it was a good reminder to me, a really good reminder of how satisfying it is to go after a, a goal objective like that and to complete it, especially when it's a public one. You know, it's not going anywhere. Everyone has access to it. You can complete it whenever you want. So you're kind of deciding when is the right time for me to complete this. And when you do, it feels really good. So that was a, a helpful reminder, reminder to me as a designer that uh, that system 
works really well and that I, I might need to incorporate that into other games as well. Chad says that looks like Walter likes his new bed. Oh yeah, Walter loves the air mattress and uh, Biddy is enjoying it as well. Michael says, greetings from the Philippines. I'm excited to play Viticulture World. I just got a notification that I will receive the wine crate next week. That's awesome, Michael. And thank you for bringing up Viticulture World. Uh, we continue to get information from our fulfillment centers about the various status of it. And uh, it looks like, I'm still waiting to hear, I'm looking at my email over here, but we're still waiting to hear a concrete answer from the UK, from Spiral Galaxy. But I think we're on track to get everything shipped out uh, to customers worldwide by the end of this week, um, which is about two weeks after the initial pre-order. So I'm excited for that, excited to get it to the, those of you who don't already have it. And uh, so I, I, if you if you haven't gotten a shipping notification, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say by the end of this week, I would wait a few days into next week. And if you still haven't gotten a shipping notification, reach out to us and see what's up. But for the most part, um, you will know when your order ships, when you get that order confirmation. And there are occasionally a few edge cases where people some, something gets lost in the process and um, we're here to help with that when that happens. But don't worry about that yet. Uh, you can start thinking about that in the middle, middle of next week. If you haven't gotten any order confirmation or you haven't actually received the order, feel free to reach out and let us know so we can look into it. Julie says, hope you stay negative, which feels like a weird thing to say. It is a, a weird thing to say, but you're right. I, I hope I stay negative as well for COVID. She says that she got COVID a month ago after two years of being very careful. So much COVID circulating out there right now. Yeah, that's a kind of, I, I'm sorry to hear that you had that, Julie. And that's one of the kind of the disappointing things that I've been experiencing. In addition to the uncertainty of not knowing if I do have it, because I don't have any symptoms. Um, just the fact that I, I've been so, so careful over the last two plus years. I really don't want to get it. I, you know, by in any way like i i know for some for someone like me who's who's vaccinated and double boosted if i do get it in all likelihood it will be fairly mild but i don't even want that like no no one wants a mild cold or the mild flu if they can choose not to get it right so for those of you who have gotten it and have suffered through it i feel for you and i'm going through that anxiety right now of really not wanting it and hopefully um hoping that my my vaccinations and my boost and my my health um get in the way of of actually contracting it so we'll see. John says that Moonrakers has been so much fun. He says the expansion drops soon. Yeah, I, I'm too new to it to get excited about the expansion yet, but I really did enjoy the core game of Moonrakers and look forward to playing it again. Sirkin says, do I have a shelf of opportunity for board games? If so, how many? How do you manage? And what is your most anticipated board game to play? I do have a shelf of opportunity. I like the way you say that. I like that term much more than shelf of shame. And it's a pretty small shelf. I keep it pretty small and I try to play through those games on a regular basis. Right now, what is on it right now? The Right now, expansions seem to be piling up on it a little bit. Like I have an expansion for Tussie Mussie that I want to play, but I haven't played it yet. Um, I have an expansion to Glenmore 2 on there that I want to play. So those are definitely up there on the list. I can't, my, the doors to my office are closed right now because I am in quarantine. Um, so I can't see it, it's right outside the door. But it's a pretty small shelf. I try to keep it small by playing those games on a regular basis. I, I do try to play new to me games on an ongoing basis, both so I can learn from them as a designer and for my YouTube channel. So I get through it pretty quickly. I rarely have more than 10 games on it that, that I haven't played. Right now I'm probably pushing 20 though, 20 games slash expansions on it that I, that I want to play that I haven't played yet. Ray says, uh, is Scythe completely done in your mind? Uh, yeah, Ray, we announced a few years ago, actually, that Scythe, we are done making stuff for the Scythe, the tabletop game. Um, I think the last thing we ever made for it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the modular board. There might, no, no, the complete rulebook was the last thing. Yeah, when we did the complete rulebook, that was when we were we said officially, hey, we're making a complete rulebook for it. This means officially we are not making any new content for Scythe, the tabletop game. I have said that I am open to exploring completely new games in the 1920 plus universe that Jakub Rosalski uh, created, um, but that, is, that would not be Scythe content. Uh, Scythe is for sure complete and done. Carol said that she had fun trying Viticulture World a few days ago, hoping to try Asia this weekend. Yeah, for those of you who already have, who already have received Viticulture World, I'm excited to see you playing through it, uh, experiencing the different continents, raiding in a board game geek if you choose to do that. And it, it coincided quite well with Viticulture's nine-year birthday or anniversary last week. 
uh, that was uh, its retail release. The ninth anniversary of its retail release was on June 10th. Jenna says, I noticed that the wine crate is out of stock. Any plans on restocking that? We do hope to make more copies of the wine crate. Um, uh, so that we haven't started reprinting it yet. Right now, we're just gathering data from the back in stock notification form. So if you are interested in it on our web sto store, fill out that little place where it says, you know, enter your email if you're interested in hearing about this when it's back in stock. Our current estimate is that we'll probably make it for release sometime in the first half of 2023. Um, so and the current plan and it really but what I'm what I'm definitely planning on doing is uh, making the next version of the wine crate without Viticulture World inside of it. So those of you who are curious about Viticulture World can safely buy it now, can play it, hopefully have fun with it, and not be concerned about having redundancy later on when we make more copies of the wine crate. So uh, yeah, so if, you're, if you want Viticulture World, go ahead and get it, and then we will most likely make the wine crate for 2023 without Viticulture World inside of it. Danny says, can I still order the wine crate? Depends on your location, Danny. I think we still have copies available in Europe and maybe in Canada, but not in the US and not in Australia as far as I know. But feel free to check your web store for the corresponding region, just to double check. I know that we don't have them in stock in the US anymore though. Chad says, I posed a question to the board game design portion of your Discord, wondering about your take. How long do you think a player's turn should take and how can we as designers mitigate that time? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, in general, I like when a player's turn can be taken in less than a minute, ideally less than 30 seconds. Um, and I think a couple of things that you can think about is how much is the game state changing between turns so a player can plan ahead between their turns? That's, I think, maybe the number one thing. If they can plan ahead about what they're going to do next without a bunch of other stuff in the game state changing to impact that decision, or to at least make it easy so they can have a primary and a backup option for those players who are good at planning ahead, I think that's maybe the number one thing. Um, and the number two thing is to not give players a whole checklist of things to go through on their turn. Um, instead, give them maybe one or two things to do on their turn at most. I think the key there, and one thing that I'm actually working through with a game design of mine right now is uh, how much, how, how little is too little basically, and how much is too much. It's kind of hard to hit that sweet spot because sometimes you want a player to do more than one thing on their turn. Like in Scythe, you can take a top row and a bottom row action, and within those actions are usually a couple different decisions points for you to make. Um, and it, sometimes if you're doing both of those, it can toe the line between too much and too little. Uh, but yeah, with the game design right now, I'm trying to figure out how much is uh, how much is too little for you to do on your turn and how much is too much and too much taking too much time. How much can can you know wait for a future turn basically? So I'm trying to figure out that right now myself actually. But I think those are the two things, the main things to think about. Justin is here from Room 51. He says, how do you figure out the core mechanisms you want to use for a game? If you have an idea to make a game, how do you know if you want to do something like action selection or action points or worker placement, etc.? That's a big question, Justin, and it really depends on the game. For me, um, oftentimes I start out with game design brainstorming with a core idea for a mechanism or a theme, and then right away I'm kind of brainstorming mechanisms that meet that theme or themes that meet that mechanism, and it gets all mashed together like that. And it's in that process that I try to figure out mechanisms that really do make sense for that theme. And it starts off pretty broad, usually, because there's so many great mechanisms to choose from, but I really try to hone in on, on, that, on that theme, on what play, what, how I want players to feel, the experience I want them to have, and the world, the theme, all of that, and how that can be best um, conveyed through the mechanisms in the game. There's no science to it. It's just me kind of puzzling, puzzling that out, but always keeping the focus on that experience, on that theme, um, and that can help narrow it down a little bit. And also it does go the other way, like I mentioned. Sometimes I do have an idea for, for what I think will be a great compelling mechanism, and I'm connecting that to a potential theme. The thing is that I found with that over and over again is that no matter how cool I think a mechanism is or how unique or innovative it is, when I actually get it to the table and play it, it can evolve so much. Like the game that I'm talking about right now with uh, with Chad here, the game that I've been working on for quite some time, um, 
the, the, I don't even remember the original mechanism for this point because it has changed so much since then. So I think it's okay to get excited about a certain mechanism and to try it out, but, uh, to, but to pay more attention to how what the player experiences and how it's connected to the theme. And that will, over time, I think, lead you to what the correct mechanism is. You can't really go in, like whatever you go into it, whatever you go into the game design with, thinking that that will be the core mechanism, I think you need the flexibility for that to, for that to change quite a bit over time. At least that's my experience. John says that he got his copy of Viticulture World and the Wine Crate. That's awesome. Jason says, after not playing it much over the last year or so, he's been playing a lot of solo games of Pendulum. Thanks for publishing such a beautiful, such beautiful innovation, innovative games. Thanks you, Jay thank you, Jason. Jason is from the Champion Faction, a YouTube channel, and he just posted yesterday a video of um, of his solo playthrough of Pendulum. Chad says, if I played Metropolis, what are your thoughts on the new Roxley implementation, Skyrise? Um, I have not played Metropolis. I did see the Kickstarter for Skyrise. I'll probably be a backer. I haven't backed it yet. Um, but I do know one thing about Roxley. They are very, very talented. Uh, I think I really have a lot of trust in Gavin and making beautiful, compelling gaming experiences. And he's also shown through his experience with Brass that he's very good at taking an older game and updating it and bringing it to life in modern form. So I, I, I can't speak specifically to Skyrise, but it looked really cool. I looked at the project page yesterday on Kickstarter and um, I have a lot of confidence in Gavin and in Roxley Games. Tim says that he's in Canada and has received the wine crate as well. He says the coin section has a pretty deep opening and the coins fall out, so I need to bag them. Was there a reason to drop that gap so low? Um, yeah, so there is a big, big section for the coins. If you look at the uh, the image on our website, uh, it's the, maybe the main reason that I, I did that is because I also store a few other components in that well. I put the coins there, um, but I don't put the... I don't put the coins there by themselves. I, I definitely do bag them. I think it's easier to, to bag them. Um, but I also put the glass beads there. You don't have to if you're worried about them breaking, but mine have never broken. And I also put the uh, a few of the tokens there, like the grape token and the, the, the extra worker token. Yeah. So that's how I store it personally. But it is very modular. I've seen some people separating the coins into different denominations in one of the other trays. You're welcome to do that. I've seen people putting the player tokens, instead of putting them in the little trays that you left out, they've been putting them in the um, the tray for the Tuscany Special Worker Meeples. That's fine too. I intended it to be somewhat modular based on what's best for you. Joshua says, do you or other designers that work with you write your own rule books? If so, could you talk about that process? I do indeed. I, I write, um, I not only write our uh, my rule books, but I do, I've started to write the rule books from other designers as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a game that we're working on that uh, the designer wrote a really wonderful rule book. And yet I went through and completely rewrote it again, um, just to make sure it is completely consistent with the Stonemaier game style. And so my process is re really just to sit down and write it. I have a rough format based on past Stonemaier games rule books that I go by. Um, but I just, I use that format. We have a style guide. I kind of keep to that. And I just takes usually a couple days to get through it. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, kind of doing the work of actually writing it. Uh, let me know if you have any more specific questions about that, about the process of, of writing it. But a lot of it is just looking at our other rule books and looking at that rule book and uh, finding the best way to, to share that information with the player, kind of keeping the focus on the player and what they need to know and in what order they need to know it. Yeah. Michael says, speaking of Tessie Mussy, are there any plans for Stomar Games to publish some micro games? Uh, so the closest we've gotten is Rolling Realms, which is not really a micro game, but our focus typically, our focus is really on event games, Michael. You can see this on our submission guidelines. We're trying to create games that are the main focus of a game night, not uh, not much shorter games. Uh, and micro, I know not all micro games are short games, but in general, they tend to be shorter games. So that isn't something that we're pursuing as a, as a core for Stomar Games, because the, the core focus for us is on event games. Nathan says his game, him and his son played through a game of Rolling Realms um, and played against me on one of the playthroughs that I have on YouTube. He says he was so excited to get to play with the guy who made it and made his day. Oh, that's wonderful, Nathan. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's been one of the joys of playing uh, Rolling Realms in, in live format in the Rolling Realms Facebook group and then putting that video on YouTube later so that I can 
kind of connect with those of you who are who are playing along with me. That was the original intent of Rolling Realms, and it's still fun to do that today. The next playthrough will start, if you want to join me, will start this Friday. So it'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't know the exact times yet. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I kind of just play it by ear on those days. I also will have a um, the next book club. Book Club Chapter 4, for those of you who are interested in maybe crowdfunding someday, I have Book Club Chapter 4 tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central Time, uh, right here on this Facebook page, in case you want to join me. You don't have to have read the chapter. It'll be 30 minutes where we'll be talking about, what is the topic? Oh, we'll be talking about mistakes that I've made and mistakes that hopefully you can avoid if you want to be a crowdfunder someday or you want to be an entrepreneur. Alex says, I hope you stay COVID-free. He says, he, he caught it three weeks ago, almost had no symptoms, just one day of soreness. He says, we are traveling to South Africa this summer for two weeks. Do you have a top 10 or top three for traveling games for two players? Awesome question, Alex. And I do, in fact, have that because Megan and I traveled to New Zealand a few years ago. And I thought a lot about travel games for two players during that time. So um, I do have a video specifically about that. Let me see if I can find it real quick for you. Um, I think it's probably under travel. Let's see if I can search for I'll search my YouTube channel for travel. Yes, my top 10 favorite travel friendly games. I will share that link in the comments below. Here we go. Yeah, I'll share that link right here for you. That sounds like a fun trip you're going on. Jasper says, do you have any anecdotes of how Viticulture transitioned from a successful Kickstarter with 1000 fans into such a broadly beloved and well circulated game? Yeah, it is kind of an amazing journey, isn't that, Jasper, for it to start out with, I mean, I think the initial print run was 2,500 units, some of which were for retail, some of which were for Kickstarter backers. And, you know, I don't even know if I can fully explain how it, how it blossomed to the point that it did. Um, I think that the original game went over well. I think people enjoyed it. It was well rated on, on Board Game Geek, which helped. Um, there were a lot fewer games coming out at that time. I don't know what would have happened if it came out today. Um, but I think part, I, I, well, I, I don't know how big this is, but part of it is that I didn't go right to print with a with a reprint. Instead, I, I actually waited a little while and I did a Kickstarter for Tuscany and Viticulture and that blew up, that got really big. That follow, that was after my Euphoria Kickstarter. Um, that also was pretty big. And so I, I don't know if, if there was, some level of uh, people wanting the game and then building up to it and seeing what we were building as a company. And then people got really excited about that Kickstarter. But then, I mean, it also has gone to a whole nother level. We've sold 200,000 copies of Viticulture Worldwide. I think the localization partners helped. I think I continually send games to reviewers for Viticulture. I think that helps. Um, and we've had expansions for it. That helps bring it back to the, into the public light. But I don't know, a lot of other games have done these things too and not sold that many copies. So uh, that's what I know. But I'm open to other other thoughts people have for why Viticulture has continued to to do so well, and, and most importantly, to bring joy to people. Julie says, "Have I considered cooperative expansions for any other Stillmeyer games? I do have one for Psy. That's just a little one. It's in the uh, the rulebook for the Rise of Fenris. So there is a little cooperative expansion for Scythe. I haven't considered it for um, for other games at this point." Uh, other other co cooperative expansions for other games. Part of it is that I'm learning from Viticultural World to see how that goes over. I would love for Elizabeth to someday consider a cooperative expansion for Wingspan, um, but I think she will be looking at the data that we learned from Viticultural World to see if that is a prudent thing to do. Uh, because de definitely when I announced Viticultural World, part of the reaction I got was, oh, I love Viticulture as a, co as a competitive game. I am not looking for a cooperative experience from this game. So. Um, but at the same time, it's, it seems to have done fairly well so far. So we will, we will see how that, how that data emerges. And I appreciate you expressing your, your curiosity and your interest in that for other games as, as well. Tom says that he's getting married in August. Congratulations, Tom. And unfortunately, my wife is making me save for that instead of buying board games. Do you think any will be remaining in the Europe store at the end of the summer? So the wine crate in particular, and is there a new, so I'll answer this question first. I think it's somewhat unlikely, Tom. Um, I mean, you, you have a shot. Let, let's see what the inventory is right now. I'll, I'll look it up while we're talking here. So there, there's a possibility, but I think the longer you wait, I, the less chance there will be that it will be left at the end of summer. However, like with all of our products, if there's demand, if there's interest, we'll make more of it. So I think there's that distinct possibility as well. 
Okay, the wine crate in Europe right now. Let's see what we have. Wine crate. We have 409 units left in stock in Europe. So actually, you might have a chance there, Tom. You might have a decent chance. So yeah, yeah. It, it, don't. I, 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 your wedding is far more important than the wine crate. So enjoy the wedding, and then hopefully we'll still have some wine crates available. And if not, we'll have more available in 2023. Tom also asked, is there a new Rolling Realms for Viticulture World or or what are these green card packs I see people receiving? So no, that we only do new Rolling Realms realms for new games, and Viticulture World isn't a new game; it's just an expansion. But uh, the green packs that you're seeing are are promo packs. They are a, a, basically an additional continent that I recommend people play the first time they play. It's very similar to the Green Gully continent that's included in, in the game, but even that as an introductory continent kind of revealed itself to be a little bit too hard. So. I uh, nerfed it a little bit and created a first game promo pack that we sell when we don't sell it. We will sell it through our web store. Right now it's free though, and it will continue to be free for anyone who orders Viticulture World or the Wine Crate directly from us. Um, it's just a first game, a continent to play the first time you play, and even the second time you play if you don't win and you want to play it again. Lucas says that he received his Wine Crate last week. I'm glad to hear people are receiving their Wine Crate. Always happy to hear that. Uh, Joshua says, I love sharing your games with people who aren't normal gamers and seeing them get the rules quicker than a lot of games, but also stretching themselves to learn heavier games than they're used to. Uh, Joshua says, I always say, yeah, Jamie knows what he's doing. I don't know. I would, I appreciate that. I don't know if I always know what I'm doing, but I'm definitely learning as I go and trying to make the onboarding process for games uh, as easy as possible. I, I definitely strive for that. Alex says, bonus question, best games, so Alex, Alex is the one going to Africa, best games with a wild animals or safari theme. And he's not including Ark Nova, which is probably the one that I would pick. Maybe Wingspan? Wingspan features a lot of wild animals. Yeah. Tim says, good morning, Jamie. Hot week, isn't it? Yeah, very hot in St. Louis. I think we've touched 100 degrees every day in St. Louis so far this week. Um, it even feels hot in here. I had the air conditioning on, but it still feels hot inside. Yeah. Hopefully you're doing okay over in Indiana, Tim. Carol says, have I pulled out any new rule books or games to keep you entertained during quarantine? Pulling out bigger rule books like Anachrony that I never had time for helped me when we went through quarantine. That's a good idea, Carol. I mean, I've tried to just busy myself with work, except for last night when I was completely out of it um, because I am working on game design. Um, but uh, it is possible I will pull out a game or play a digital game or something like that if I need to. But also, Megan and I have been masking inside the rest of her house. So, so I can still see Megan. I can hang out with Megan. I just have to wear a mask when I do so. So there's kind of a, always a timer to how long I actually want to wear a mask before I need to go back to my little space here in the, the office slash temporary bedroom. And again, for those of you joining me, I don't have COVID as far as I know. I just had a prolonged exposure to someone who turned out to have COVID uh, last Saturday. So I'm kind of in the waiting and seeing period right now if I end up testing positive. So far, I've tested negative or if I develop symptoms. I'm hoping I don't, but that's where I am right now. Viticulture World Designer Francesco Tastini popped into the comments. He's here if you have any questions for Francesco. Joshua says he started reading Leviathan Wakes from the, the Expanse series, uh, which I have read. I love that book series. I could never really get into the show, but I absolutely love the book series for The Expanse. I highly recommend it for those of you who enjoy sci-fi. Tim says that he's enjoying Viticulture World. He was a little confused with the, why there were two versions of Green Gully. Yeah, I just mentioned that again, a second ago to Tom, that one version was the version that came with the game. The other version was, is the easier version for the use the first time you play. And Tim says he would love to see more promo worlds. I think that that's a possibility someday. We don't have any in the works, but it, it's a, certainly a possibility. I look forward to seeing what, some, what fans create. If fans want to create promo packs, or not promo packs, but continents, from, from other worlds of Stillmire games. I, I would be especially curious to see that you know, in the uh, Viticulture Facebook group or on Board Game Geek or in the Stillmire Games YouTube, uh, Discord channel, that YouTube channel. Uh, Efren, has a very, Efren, you have a very specific order question there. Sounds like that's something to maybe relay to Joe at joe at stillmiregames.com so we can look into it and see what's happening there. Yeah. and other people say they've received the wine crate. Uh, Donna says, I just found, found out there was a print and play expansion for Viticulture. Will those be available again to download? Yeah, they're, they've been available to download for quite some time and will continue to be. They're, they're on our website right now, Donna. So there were a few modules from the very original Tuscany that I didn't I deemed as non-essential 
Um, and by that, I mean, I don't think they're all that, all that good. I, I'm the designer. I'm saying I don't think they're very good, but you're welcome to download them and print them and play them if you'd like. And two of them are those that enough people, not enough for us to mass manufacture it, but enough people have said that they, they like it, that they want like a official looking version for Maggio and Arbor culture. Those are available from a company called Print and Play Productions. We have authorized them and helped them make a semi-official looking version of those, those modules. So those are also linked to on our website. I think it's on the Tuscany page of our website if you check that out. Chad says, the glass bees in Viticulture are very unique to Viticulture. I don't know that I've seen them in other games. There are glass tokens in other games, but the very specific small and the, the sp specific curvature of the beads in Viticulture is, uh, I think, specific to Viticulture itself. He says, were they difficult to acquire when you first made Viticulture? Do they tend to be more on the expensive side because they are not used very often? I don't think they're all that expensive. We may, I can't even remember now. It's been so long. I can't remember if we made them specifically for Viticulture or we found a supplier that uh, that worked out well. It did take a little while. In fact, even the first printing of Viticulture had bigger, kind of the bigger glass tokens that you see in potted plants and other games. Um, but I thought they were too big. And so we went in search of better tokens and we found these, these smaller tokens that we've used ever since. Tim says that Knight's Fall from Red Raven looks interesting. Uh, artwork from, you know, I've, I've not heard of that, Tim. I'll have to look up Knight's Fall. I'll make a note of that. Jerry says that he received Viticulture World in the wine crate as well. That's awesome. Knight's Fall. Thanks, Jerry, for sharing that. He says, uh, personally, what's your personal criteria for deciding, what, deciding whether or not your game gets sleeved or not? Do you have any preferred brand and thickness that you recommend? I am not a sleever, Jerry. Um, I don't think I've personally sleeved a single one of my games. So I, uh, I'm a, yeah, it's just, it's not a priority for me to sleeve my games. However, I do understand that some people do uh, want to sleeve. And so we try to make our inserts sleeve friendly as, as, as much as we can. Um, the, if I were ever to sleeve a game, it would be a game, it would be a game like a deck building game where you're constantly shuffling the game, the cards. If you're only shuffling the cards once per game, I don't think that's a, a game that needs to be sleeved in my opinion. I know that other people disagree with that, but that's, that would be like the very baseline for me that a game would need to be one where I'm constantly shuffling those cards throughout the game for me to even consider sleeving it. But no, I, I don't sleeve sleeve my cards, so I don't have a recommended game uh, brand. I have heard that Sleeve Kings are, is the brand that best fits the wine crate, though. Yeah. Michael says, are you playing your own design games in Board Game Arena? Um, I have played my, my games in Board Game Arena. Yeah, I've, I've played, so far, what do we have? Viticulture and Tapestry? I think those, those are the only two, but I have played both of them on Board Game Arena. Alan says, how's the Tapestry digital version going? I would love to play it more often than I do in the physical version. So we have the Board Game Arena version. The full AI version is in the works. I got an update maybe a month ago, I think, from the developer working on it, and they just said they're actively working on it, but I don't have any further updates about that right now. I also don't have any further updates about other games that Board Game Arena is working on, or even though I, I can't even really say what those games are, but they are working on some other Stillmeyer games to put on their platform. Yeah. Justo says, what is your furthest developed but eventually scrapped design? That's an interesting question, Juso. Um, usually, I, I, I know within a few play tests if it's a game that I want to continue with or go further with. I would say the game that went the furthest is actually a game that was designed by some other designers. I had an idea for a game, and I said, you know, I'm really busy right now. I don't have time to work on this game, but I trust you as designers. You want to work on this. And we even had the art for it. We went through, they went through full designs, I think like four or five complete designs from scratch and full play test. And I play tested a number of times, but in the end, we just decided it wasn't ready. It wasn't publishable. Um, it was fine, but it wasn't great. And I'm not going to publish something that we just think is fine. So that is a game that I still hope will be brought to life someday because I do have all the art for it. I still think the core idea, something in that is, is there, um, the core theme at least. But, um, but mechanically, it does need quite a bit of work. So that was one that really, like, it was on our, you may have even seen it on our, um, on our progress chart for a while because we were moving forward so well with it. And then we realized it just wasn't good enough. Kevin says, a lot of actors say that they do not like to watch their own work. Do you like to play your own games? If you do, 
do you wish you could go back and change aspects of your design? I actually did a vi video very recently, Kevin, about my top design regrets in all of our games. So I do have some small re regrets about every single game. I do always approach any game that I play with a certain analytical element where I'm looking at kind of probing it and seeing what could be better. Uh, I do enjoy playing my games, but only if the person I'm playing with is excited to play them. Uh, I'm never trying to force my games onto someone else. I, I'm only playing, and that's the case for all games that I play, but especially for the games that I've designed, I really only want to play them if, if the other person is excited to play them. So that is something that I think about a lot with, with uh, the games that I, that I make. But I am, I mean, I only publish games that I genuinely enjoy playing, so I'm always happy to play any of my games and happy to teach any of them as well. Craig says, I saw someone post that they received a signed Viticulture World uh, Viticulture card, card with their wine crate. Is this something you do with all your first print runs? No, Craig, it's something that we actually do on an ongoing basis. There's a, there's a, a, a product on our web store that is a random signed card from one of our games. It's not game specific. You can just add it to your cart. So it's it's a dollar. Uh, and if you want a signed card, you can you can just buy it on our, on our website. So I think if you search our web, so web store for the word signed, you can see it. And it's something that's available on an ongoing basis. We do ask people don't to not order it by itself, but to order it with something else so that we're not just shipping a single card somewhere. And to only order one at a time, one per order, um, just so there can be enough for everyone. Because it does, it takes me a while to sign the cards. It's not a burden, but uh, I can only sign a certain number at a, at a, at a, at a given time. So um, sometimes they do run out, and then, then I sign some more and put it back on the web store. A lot of questions today. I haven't even gotten to my topics. Let me run through my topics real quick, so just so you have something to think about. Um, I've actually actually already done a lot of them. My video this past week was a deep dive into Dune Imperium, one of my favorite games. So if you like those deep design, deep dive videos, I did one of those this past weekend on Dune Imperium. The blog posts I did recently were about deluxe games, specifically in terms of how publishers, um, how responsible publishers are for the feelings that they create. Uh, for people, uh, the gamers, when they when they create anything, but especially when they offer a super expensive deluxe thing that they know not everyone can afford. I had some interesting opinions about that, um, or I saw some in the comments, and I shared my thoughts on that in Monday's blog post. And then I talked about Viticulture and Red and Blue Cards and Pride Month in on Thursday's post last week, if you're interested in that topic. We also last Thursday had a wonderful, oh, was it Friday? Friday, we had a wonderful team lunch, a virtual team lunch for, with the whole Stillmeyer Games team where we all got on a video chat and just ate lunch together and chatted, nothing business related. Um, and that was really, really nice just to, to see everybody. We, we don't do that very often at all. And I want to I want to try to do that more often, maybe once a month, every, uh, every other month. And I've also been working on, as you can probably tell from some of the things I've talked about today, I've been working on game design a lot and, and play testing for certain products that we're working on right now. Jason says, I know that you intentionally release only a handful of products a year, usually one to two new games and one to two expansions. And that is correct. Yeah, you do have that correct. Are you happy with that pace? I am happy with that pace. Yeah, that's, I really like to shine the spotlight on the things that we create and not dilute it with a bunch of different products, not cast a wide net, really focus on just a few things, hopefully respecting your time, your budget, um, your, your gaming energy, and also, uh, respecting everyone who puts so much work into each of these games and each of these expansions. He says, has the pandemic affected the pace of new releases for your company? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. No, I mean, there, there have been, like, I have a few games that I've been working on that have taken longer than I thought, but it isn't pandemic related. It's related to the game design and me wanting the game to be, or those games to be as good as they can possibly be. Um, so I, I, I would not, I, I would, no, I wouldn't say that the pandemic has really impacted that pace. Maybe it impacted the, the next Wingspan expansion a little bit because Elizabeth does a lot of playtesting with a variety of people and she wasn't able to, to do that for a while. And I think that's a, that's a tough motivating factor when, when you have a game or, or an expansion that you want to playtest with people and you aren't able to, especially early on in the pandemic when, when that was very, very difficult. Um, it's tough to motivate yourself to continue to, to work on it if no one is there to play test it. So I think that may have impacted that expansion a little bit, but not significantly as far as I can tell. Par is joining us from Sweden. He's going to get his copy of Viticulture World tomorrow. I need to take a drink here. My mouth's getting dry. Sky says, 
One of Stomara's design tenets is that all games are playable and enjoyable with as few as one player and as many as at least five or six players. Since your solo modes are designed by Automa Factory during development, how do you evaluate whether an outside game submission will be playable with one player before you move forward with them? It's just something I keep an eye on. Um, yeah, you're right that it, it is not, we don't view that as the designer's responsibility, the multiplayer designer's responsibility. We instead look to the Automa Factory to create solo modes for our games. But it's something that I think about when I review game submissions, and I often do talk to Morton about it as well. I, if there's a game that we're really interested in, I'll share it with him if I think there's any concerns so he can let me know up front if it's a game that just won't work solo. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Efren says, I would love to see small wine bottles made with the same material as the beads. G glass wine bottles. So there are wine bottles that you can buy. I think Meeple Source sells them. Top Shelf Gamer sells them. I don't think they're glass, though. I think making them in glass would be a little difficult. But uh, feel free to let those, those great third-party companies know about that, and maybe some of them will, will figure it out. Molly says, I've been loving the Stomar Games Discord. Thank you for making it. Thank you for being so active there, Molly. And anyone else who's been active in the Stomar, Stomar Games Discord channel, it's been neat to see the conversations there. I know I'm only popping in here and there. Um, I'm happy to always chime in if someone tags me. That's, that's the easiest way for me to see if, if I should chime in. But I am enjoying the conversations when I'm able to pop in and see what's going on there. Andrew says, I thought about you today. Have you played or spoken about Dicey Dungeons? I feel like you'd love that game. I have not played that. I don't actually know much about that, Andrew. But thank you for the recommendation. I'm going to write it down right now and look into Dicey Dungeons. There is one game I played. Let me let me look it up real quick to see if... if um, Dicey Dungeons. It's a video game. No, I don't think I played that one. Roguelite deck building game with uh with a dice that does look fun no i i haven't uh i haven't played that one andrew but i'll, I'll check it out i'll add it to my steam wish list right now if i can do that easily i gotta sign in i'll work that out later but yeah i brought it up on steam i'll add that to my my wish list i'm kind of backed up right now on so I, there are some games i don't play a lot of video games but there are some games some digital games that i want to try and i have them on my list and i've even bought some of them but i haven't Whenever I sit down to play a video game, I always feel like I should be designing the game instead. And so there are games that I really want to play here. I'll, I'll read you, I'll share with you the digital games on Steam that I want to play that I haven't, many of which I already own. And I just, every time I sit down to play them, I'm like, you know, I should be working on game design right now. They are Into the Breach, uh, Might and Magic Clash of Heroes, Rogue Book, Legends of Runeterra, uh, Sable, and Tunic. I think I hit all of them there. And A Short Hike and 8-Minute Empire. All of those are games that I either have or own or have bought digitally, but haven't played yet, but want to. Let me know if any of you have played any of those games and if you think I should bump it up to the top of the list. Corey says, have, have, he just booked a, a board game cruise with Meeples at Sea. Have you ever done a board game cruise before? I have not. I've not done. I've never actually even done any a cruise in any form. No. I hope you have fun with it, though. I've heard good things about them. I think jo Josh Ward, one of our very active ambassadors and helpers, proofreaders, he has had good experiences, I think, with the Dice Tower cruise in the past. Or maybe the Joko cruise. One of the two. He's enjoyed one of the cruises. Carlos says, one of the downsides of keeping game information secret until close to pre-order is that the games may not be part of the conversations for most anticipated games for a given year. You've changed a few things as to how you reveal games. Have you considered in December revealing the box art of the games that are in pre-production as a way to start teasing them and making them eligible for those anticipated lists by content creators? That would give the games a little bit of pre-buzz without giving too much away, and you'll only be revealing info of a game that you'll definitely release. Um, it's, a, it's a great point, Carlos. Yeah, we do miss out on those most anticipated lists. I don't think they're, they're necessarily all positive, um, but I think... For the most part, I think it's positive to, to get games on those lists. Um, I've thought about it. Yeah, I've thought about it. We might do it in, in, the, in the future. I think it would have to be games that we're definitely releasing that year. I mean, all too often, I'm sure you've seen games where people say they're going to release them and then they aren't actually ready yet and they don't release them in the next year or even the next year. So it would only be games that for sure that we would be releasing in the next, um, in the next 12 months. Um, it's possible. 
yeah, it's something I think I actually have a calendar reminder this year to uh, for me to to think about doing that for doing a, a fun reveal. I am I would say I'm less focused on doing that for the most anticipated list and more interested in doing that for Stillmire Games fans for for doing that as kind of fan service to reveal a little sneak peek into the world ahead so they can get excited about it. That's I care about that I think a lot more than those lists. But I guess in terms of marketing I should think about lists like that too. Donna said, speaking of signed cards, are there scythe signed cards? I keep trying to have a nice collection of Red Rising, but no scythe. There are plenty of scythe cards. Yeah, there are. Uh, but they are random. The cards are random. So, uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't think it was a good idea for us to ask the Fulfillment Center to, to select in individual cards. Um, that adds a, a complication to the fulfillment process. So we do have signed scythe cards. What you could do, Donna, is... And you may have already done this, but some people I, I see posting in like the Red Rising group or the Scythe group and say, hey, I have a, a couple of signed cards from Red Rising. Now I'd love to trade them with someone who ended up with a Scythe signed card. Um, but there definitely are side, side, signed Scythe side cards amongst the, the signed cards on our web store. Evend says, uh, fellow board game publisher here, do you have any tips when looking for external developers or collaborators? Um, external developers... So um, we, so I have I have a great group of playtesters, and many of the playtesters I trust on the level of a developer, where I'm sending them a game and I'm really trusting their feedback. I'm not just asking. Oftentimes for playtesters, I'm just asking for like what happened, why did it happen, give me examples, and I'll figure out the solutions. But for some people, some of those playtesters, I do ask for what I would typically ask a developer, which is not only what is the problem, but what is your proposed solution for it. Um, and so I've kind of cultivated that list over time through Stonemaier Games ambassadors, and I also have a specific quiz that I that I send to ambassadors to see if I think they will be a good playtester. I have an article about this on the Stonemaier Games website called uh, I think Finding the Best Testers. It's under the um, How to Design a Tabletop Game category on our website if you want to look for that. So that is something that you could look into if you're looking to find some good playtesters that could someday be considered developers. Um, as for collaborators, that's a big term. There's lots of different collaborators. So uh, if you're looking, talking about game designers, like designers who might design a game and submit it to you, you can look through our submission process for how we do it. It's really not about us actively going out there and seeking the games, but rather having information on our website. So if someone likes Stomar Games or think that, thinks they have a game for Stomar Games, they can go to our submission page and, uh, and submit a game to us. Yeah. The Excel Gamer says, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm curious. When designing a game, are you more likely to have a theme first and then apply mechanisms, or do you have mechanisms in the mind and then apply a theme? I bet it's a mixture, but curious what your focus is when you start designing. Um, it really depends on the game. I'm trying to think right now. Yeah, it, it really depends. Uh, but I, I would say in general, I mean, my general answer to this is that it doesn't end up mattering much because from the moment I start brainstorming, whether or not I have a mechanical idea or a thematic idea, I am mixing together theme and mechanisms immediately on pencil and paper. So I don't think it really, I think it's okay. I, for me, it, it starts with either and then right away it becomes both it, it, almost instantly. Yeah. Joshua says, what type, ty, what ty, kind of music do you love listening to? My favorite style would be folk, modern or older. And sometimes I enjoy 1920s big band or relaxing jazz. I actually don't listen to music very often at all. Um, I, I work in silence. I drive either in silence or I listen to podcasts. When I do listen to music, uh, what can I call it? So there's a band called Typhoon that pretty much sums up everything that I love about music. Um, Typhoon is, I don't know what you call like pop, folk, alternative rock, maybe? Maybe you'd call it that? I don't know how, do any of you know the band Typhoon or the band uh, The Generationals? How would you classify that music? Um, yeah, that, I, I, don't, I don't know how to classify it, but those are some of my favorite bands right there that I really, really do love. But uh, I would say it's, it's got to have a, a, a good beat to it. So I like a little bit of pop to it, but, um, but I also like kind of an alternative folksy edge to it as well. What about you all? What, what, what is your favorite band right now? What music are you listening to right now? The Excel ga Gamer mentions Fleet Foxes, Punch Brothers, Trampled by Turtles. I know Fleet Foxes. I don't know those other two. I did find I, there's a band, um, shoot, I'll pull it up because I discovered a band last year that I instantly fell in love with that I highly recommend if you like Typhoon and Generationals. 
Oh, uh, Me Like Bees. Me Like Bees is the name of the band. They are, they are amazing. Me Like Bees, if you want to check them out. Chad says, one thing I love from Dune Imperium is the tightness of the victory points, specifically the fact that you can lose points that you work so hard to achieve. I've heard that some say that this makes a negative experience. What are your thoughts on losing points that you've worked hard to achieve? Um, so I think the key here is that you haven't actually lost progress. So the points that you can gain and then lose in Dune Imperium are on the influence tracks. And what you can at times make choices to move down on the influence tracks, but that's always your choice to do that. Rather, it's a competition at the top of the track to decide who gets to keep the, the transient victory point from that track. And for me, the key is that, it can, that there's tension that it can be taken away, that someone else could potentially race up there and take it away from you. You can see them coming, though. It isn't a surprise um, unless they use an entry card to surprise you a little bit. But uh, generally, you can see them coming. And you have not lost your progress. You've just lost the victory point. So I think it works really, really well. I love the tension of it. And I love that you keep your progress and often still have a chance at getting that point back unless the other player has topped off the track. So I really like it. And I don't see it as a negative at all. I do respect anyone else who has a difference of opinion there, but I think it's important for them to remember that they have not lost their progress. They've only lost the point. Joseph says, what, Joseph says, what's your favorite bear species? Do you have a game that you recommend that involves bears? Uh, bear in Park, I would say, is the main bear game out there. Um, and Ark Nova has some great bears in it as well. What's my favorite bear species? I like... Uh, I like pandas. I mean, pandas are fun, to, just fun to watch roll around. Any bear that, 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 that moves by rolling around is absolutely adorable to me. George popped in real quick to say hi here. Uh, Carol echoes Molly's comment about having fun with Discord. I'm glad to hear that, that Carol. Jerry, Jerry says, do you have any favorite mass market games like Monopoly, Clue, Telestrations that you think deserve more positive recognition? Well, tell, I'm glad you included Telestrations on this list because Telestrations, code names, just one. I think those are wonderful, fantastic mass market games. Um, I mean, I, I look at my, my older games like Stratego and Scotland Yard. Those are some classic older games that, uh, that, I, that I think are considered mostly mass market games. And even fairly recently, a game from my childhood, I, I think it probably went out of print for a while, but Key to the Kingdom, a game that I loved as a kid, recently has a new version from, from Restoration Games that I think deserves to be among these wonderful uh, mass market games. The new version of Key to the Kingdom by Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley is really a delight to play. Um, it, is, it certainly is not a heavy game. It's not one that I pull, pull out at a game night all that often, but I had a lot of fun with it. I did a video about that on Tuesday, and I would recommend it. And that's one that, even though the current version, I would say, I, I would not guess is a mass market game yet. The original game, I think, was. And I'm curious to see if the new one becomes that. If you want to see, like, roll and move do, uh, done well, check out the new Key to the Kingdom. Maxime is joining us from Quebec. He says, I spoke with Matigo for the French version of the nesting box for Wingspan, and they confirmed they would produce it, which he's really excited about. I'm just a bit confused about the expansion being shipped inside the nesting box. Will the expansion have its own box, or will the content be spread loose inside the nesting box? It won't be spread loose, but it'll it'll be packed inside of the nesting box. The nesting box negates the need for a box, so we can serve the, the environment better and serve you as a customer better by not asking you to pay for a box by putting the uh, that new Wingspan expansion inside the nesting box without its own box. So it's not like it's going to be just like floating around inside the box. But uh, the, the components will be, will be in the nesting box. Efren says he has the Viticulture Kickstarter, which includes the Advanced Visitors. I also have the Moors and Rhine expansions. Which would you say is the ultimate set or combination? And are you planning on making a set that combines the best of all? I mean, I would say that set is Viticulture Essential. That, that's, uh, that's, that's the best of the best of Viticulture. Um, and each expansion is completely separate from that. It, we don't do any redundancy within expansions. We don't make a big box thing that then creates redundancy based on what you've already owned. Um, so Efren, I don't know, my, the, the typical way that I play Viticulture is I play with, uh, with more visitors just shuffled in. And it, it, usually that's the way I play because it gives you the most visitor cards to play with. But I do enjoy Rhine Valley, the Rhine Valley expansion. So every now and then I'll set aside those other visitor cards and just play with Rhine Valley by themselves. So, um, yeah, I would say one of those two ways 
depends on maybe the player count too. If you if you have a big player count, you might need more visitor cards. So it might be easier to play with more visitors and all the other visitors from the core game. You can't shuffle in Rhine Valley with more visitors. They were not designed to be, or with any other visitors really. Rhine Valley is designed to be played by itself. John says, I saw on the Gen Con map, map that Stillmeyer had a booth there. Are there any other cons that you would be into being at in the future? Um, I should clarify that, John. We don't really have a booth at Gen Con. Meeple Source has a booth at Gen Con, and they represent Stillmeyer Games there. But we are not a convention-driven company, um, especially in terms of marketing, which is, is not a, a focus of ours. So it's something that Meeple Source handles for us. They'll, they'll, they have volunteers. They'll have games of ours to sell their products of ours to sell there, including some wine crates. They're the one retailer that will get some wine crates because they'll be representing us at Gen Con. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it really, it, the, the only convention that I personally attend, other than the Summer Games Design Day, is Geekway to the West in St. Louis. Yeah. Joseph says, are there going to be ambassador t-shirts for sale in the near future? Uh, they're actually... Uh, check your email, Josek. Um, if you are currently an ambassador, you you should know about this. So check your email, check your spam folder about that. Julie says, of your published games, is there a game that experienced the most dramatic change in mechanism from start to finish? Of my published games, what did? Uh, Charterstone changed quite a bit, although it was always, I always had the idea of making it a shared village worker placement game. So that, even though the, how that worked changed quite a bit over time, um, it still ended up being that. What else? Uh, tapestry, the, the way the tech tracks worked changed significantly over time, but it was always a game about these kind of tech tracks that you're progressing on. Scythe, actually, Scythe changed quite a bit. Scythe was originally um, much more inspired, actually, by Dead of Winter. And uh, Dead of Winter and what was the other game? There's a game from Portal Games that involves asymmetric... Uh, decks of cards. It was inspired by those originally, and I ended up moving away from that. And so Scythe's mechanisms, I would say, changed the most for any published game so far. George says, how can one, how can an ambassador become a proofreader for Stomar Games? I'm curious what set of skills they must have for this. Would it, would like to test it once to see if I'm fit for it? Is it, is it required to be a native English speaking person? Um, no, it isn't. That isn't a requirement. Uh, we, so basically, George, I, I have a list of proofreaders that we turn to, and I don't think we really need more than we currently have, to be honest. Proofreading is not an area where more is necessarily better. Uh, I found that for playtesting, too, where quality is better than quantity. I'm not saying that you would not be a, a quality play, proofreader, but because we already have what I think is enough, enough proofreaders for our games, um, we're not actively looking for more. And I then I do, if we ever do need to look for more, I have a list of proofreaders that, that I look at um, that I already have. And kind of the, the test for every proofreader is even in just like the email they send me to introduce themselves, uh, how, how so I, I kind of proofread their own emails to see if, if, um, if I think they could be a good proofreader. And, but I don't have a, a test that I send to proofreaders, no. unlike the, the play tester test that I have. Okay, Joshua says that Wikipedia says that Typhoon is an American indie rock band from Portland. Okay, American indie rock is perhaps my favorite genre of music then. Donna says that Me Like Bees comes to Appleton for Mile of Music fairly frequently. They are awesome. Oh, that's awesome, Donna, that you've heard of them and that, you even, that you've seen them play live. I haven't gotten to see them play live yet, uh, but I'm hoping to in the future. Joshua says that the band Passenger is one of his modern folk favorites. I feel he has a very unique voice that doesn't fit his look. I'll have to check out Passenger, music from Passenger. Do you have a favorite song that I should start with there, Joshua? Uh, Greg says that you would like some progressive rock. His favorite band is Renaissance, heyday in the 70s, and their lead singer, Annie Haslam. Worth taking a look, Renaissance. And I'll ask you the same question there, uh, Greg. Do you have a favorite song from Renaissance that I should start with? Simon says you should make a board game about starting a band, recording albums, going on tour. There are some bands, uh, games about that. There's a game called On Tour. It's an excellent game. And there is a game that I, I can't remember. I think it's on my shelf of opportunity that is about um, filming, a, creating a record, filming a record. Not filming, creating. 
Efren also says that he loved the, the Key to the Kingdom game as a kid. Where can I get the new one? Uh, you can probably get it directly from Restoration Games or from a retailer. I think it does have a retailer release right now. And he loves Stratego too. Yeah, I played a lot of Stratego when I was a kid. I love Stratego. Oh, we're right at 11 o'clock. I, I think uh, that worked out perfectly. So I hope you all are doing well. Thank you for, so, for joining me for today's chat for these wonderful questions. Um, I always love the questions. I barely even turn on my own topics today because the questions were so great and so varied. I hope you all have a great week. I hope you don't get COVID as always. And I'm hoping that I don't have COVID. I'll find out tomorrow. And uh, I'm not, I don't feel like I do. I don't feel like I do, but we'll find out soon. Oh, here we go. I gotta wait for the answers to those questions. Greg says, Northern Lights is the song that he recommends starting out with for Renaissance. So I'll check that out, Northern Lights. And I'll just have to find one of Passenger's most popular songs. I'll check that out. But yeah, thank you for the music recommendations today. Interesting that we went. Oh, here we go. No, Joshua said, The Wrong Direction. The Wrong Direction. Awesome. I'll check those out. All right, everybody. I'll see you over on YouTube if you have any follow comments or questions. Have a great day. Bye.